Hello and welcome back to the Rugby Pod. I'm Andy Rowe. Big Jim and Goody are with me as usual and we'll get into the Six Nations action shortly, especially after Wales fell just short of sealing the Grand Slam in Paris. But first, let's get straight into the important stuff, shall we? How's your week been, boys? I lost my blue tick oh. on Twitter. Mate, what's happened? What you talk yourself happened? up as a media mate. You talk yourself up as a media mongol, if you're allowed to say that. You can't. And you know, have you what's happened? Have you sold your soul? Have you have you given it to someone else for money? Well, what's going on, Jim? You're you're basically a nobody now. I tried to change my name on Twitter just over the weekend, um, and it was I shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have done it, Andrew. It was stupid. It was silly. It was immature. So I've gone back with my towel between my legs to Twitter and said, look, I, I, Andrew, Andy Rowe and the Rugby Pod are on Spotify. I need a blue tick. Otherwise, it might not materialise. So I had a bit of drama around that. So I was panicking over the weekend. Uh, Scotland had a team run. We can talk about that. And Andrew, it was a bit last minute today, being Monday, the day we record the podcast. I've decided to hit a triathlon or a sprint triathlon. Let's call it a triathlon with Andy Rowe. Call it an Ironman. Yeah, call it an Ironman, exactly. Yeah, call it a double Ironman through the night. And uh, about training today, Andrew, I don't know if you saw it on Instagram, where I have got a blue tick. I had me... What, what do you call it, Andy Rowe? What do you call that thing? Where is you, that a Borat like, suit? It's like skin-tight yeah. dungarees. Yeah, what you is your, it? your Borat suit on. Your I had bib, me Borat suit. Or your bib shorts. And I did 15K on the bike and I effectively walked backwards for the other 4K in training. Absolutely horrendous. But my point being, can you believe it's been nearly two years since the last time I embarrassed myself and did one? Goody, because you are looking better and better as the days and the weeks go by. You almost look ill, like as in you you look ill before, (laughs) you look ill now. Will you join us? Will you join us? Andy Rowe, where is it? Tell us where it is, Rowe. I don't know what I'm signing up to. Eaton Dorney. So it's where they had the rowing and the water sports for the 2012 Olympics. I don't know. So Olympics posh. Yeah. Out near so Eat- Eaton. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that where all these guys who are in politics went to? I they did, so. James. There's a fair few that went yeah. to Eat- Eaton. No doubt. I keep out of that. But um, that's where it is. Good. Are you in or not? Uh, I'll be honest. Uh, the answer is still going to be a no. Because uh, as you know, James, and as the millions of listeners know, uh, not only did I have major surgery on my knee a couple of years ago, I'm recovering from major surgery on my ankle. And the positive, the positive to my surgeries is that I can never run again. Um, I could do the cycling, no problem. Without a shadow of a doubt, cycling and the swimming, I'd dominate the pair of you. Actually, I wouldn't dominate Jim and the cycling. I'd dominate you both at swimming. But um, yeah. I, I feel like I, you've I, made I, that I, up a little bit. It's like the I can't run. injury. I can't yeah, run anymore. Can't run anymore, boys. But road, you see road, these videos. Road running. Nah, you see, the, you see these, you see these videos, Andrew, that go viral on YouTube though of people dragging other people who can't run for whatever reason. We uh, could do an emotive video. You don't want you don't want me sat in the back of uh, some pull along cart where you've got to run with it after seeing your embarrassment of, of literally walking, think, <laughs> thinking you were running at about thirty miles an hour when you're walking backwards. It was just embarrassing, mate. So very true. Andrew, five, would you? I, would you I haven't got five hours you? to be dragged. I haven't got five hours to be dragged around by you uh on a uh what do you call it again a tractor would you let me pull you yes or no uh if you do the swim and the cycle if you do the swim and the cycle i will pull you around please it's flat (laughs) apparently and we could call it we we could call it we could make a video and call it eat a mess get it we could and you could could. do the whole thing eating eating mess oh too many calories though because now with my twink meals and what i'm eating um i just don't eat those calories i'm down my calorie intake's down i'm down to eight and a half kilos lost now um so i lost another kilo this week uh, how do you lose a kilo in a week <laughs> what you... just food intake mate calorie deficit i can teach you about this now now I do you feel a... okay do you feel okay do you have a headache and stuff or not no i feel good i feel good like i'd love to eat a lot more chocolate i mean i'm missing it i really am but luckily because i'm not actually getting around that much at the minute i'm not dreaming of chocolate and i think i've earned a chocolate bar here or there i haven't the star bars i haven't had a star bar for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and i would love a star bar right now trust me Um, any alcohol no not drinking in 2021 i have not had an alcoholic beverage cigarettes crazy no cigarettes jim you know that i don't smoke (laughs) no vape no vape vape. (laughs) plenty of coke zero cherry uh but no no alcoholic beverages 
Where's it's kind of boring. To... I just need a live show, and then I am going to cut loose like you wouldn't believe. But yeah, talking... kebabs all around. Yeah, talking about live shows and everything, um, we announced a Spotify deal last week, and I must say, the amount of messages we've had uh, from fans and people and friends, um, it's just been unbelievable. Uh, so a massive thank you. I haven't been able to respond to absolutely every single message, but yeah, it was um, very humbling last week after we made the announcement, not only all over social media, but all over the podcast. And the feel-good factor still there when people are saying you deserve it and all that stuff. So a massive thank you to everyone that sent us messages. Um, the way it's coming off, Jim started trying. We're getting serious now, Jim, hey? We are getting serious. I was a little bit overwhelmed, I'll be honest. <laughs> Tuesday, Wednesday, I was exhausted. I had an adrenaline dump. On t- Not literally, it's, it's just the same one. It's, it's, it's what they say in the fitness industry when you have an adrenaline dump. And uh, yeah, so I had yeah, that. Big thank you to everyone who reached out. And, you know, from all corners of the globe, of course, you know, we've got worldwide, wide, 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 wide. And, yeah, very humbling. We've just got to deliver now, haven't we? So, I don't know. You know what? Yeah. The podcast has been released on Tuesday. I don't want to sensationalise a date. The 23rd of March, why is that an appointment day? I'll answer. No. I'll answer. Go on, James. Day, you tell us. The, the day we went into lockdown last year, the 23rd uh, of March. I thought Can you were going to say it's when Tiger King was released. That could have been a week after or two weeks after, but that is a poignant moment in life, in my life anyway. Can you believe it's been one year that it's we crazy. have been in this situation? Yeah, it's crazy, wow. isn't it? Absolutely crazy. And we were, allowed, we're allowed to take that year off, aren't we? So I'm still 39, is that right? 100% you are, but this is madness. Madness, this is China! Can you say that or not? <laughs> this, I'm not living in China, mate. You might be up in Scotland, but not down here. Mm, yeah, one year. Well, should we talk about some rugby then? Oh, please. Okay, I mean, okay. I mean, we're called the rugby pod, so should, we probably should. We might as well. We might as well. That's what, we're, that's what we're paid the big bucks to do. Now we're on Spotify. Ireland v England, we'll talk about that later on and how bad England were. But let's go straight to start the France Saturday night. How good was how that? How good? Should Wales have been able to see it out, do you think? What happened there? Yeah, unbelievable game, wasn't it? Was it as good as Jono, Jamie Roberts and Sam Warburton made out? Like, they were making out it was the best game they've ever seen. Jono, he must be out of contract with the BBC because <laughs> he, he put in his A-game. He put in his A-game. <laughs> That's the best I've ever seen him on TV. He loved it. it yeah, he's good, Jono. It's, mate, it was it was a phenomenal game, back and forth. Um, loads of drama around decisions, the amount of times Wayne Barnes was involved with, whether it was held up, whether it was a try. Um and unfortunately for Wales, you talk about luck and what's happened. They got to get to round five with the, the Grand Slam on the line. And unfortunately for them, their luck ran out towards the death. And, um, you know, Feb played a France, again, a French team of many a year gone by would have perhaps capitulated after the red card and being 10 points down. Um, but things transpired. There can be a couple of complaints, I think, from the Welsh uh, with a few decisions, uh, Jim, Which you'll ones? know more about this than anyone. Penalty try when Mohamed Hawass, how's that? Hawass, how's that? Been, How is that? Uh, when he's been yellow carded, uh, cries for a penalty try potentially. Liam Williams is yellow card as well at mm. the end. Uh, Nigel Owens has come out and said it's not a yellow card, and I know Nigel Owens is Welsh, uh, but he's not going to put his referee in. IQ on the line and say that's not a yellow card if he doesn't believe it was, even though he's. I world- disagree with Nigel. But he's, the <laughs> cl- he's the world class referee, mate. So what do we know? Yeah, yeah, very true. He's, <laughs> he's refereed a World Cup final. Um, yeah. and, and then obviously, uh, when, when they, and the thing with Liam Williams, when he gets the yellow card, where do they score right at the death? They run out of one defender on the edge, which is where he would have been as the fullback. Um, and that's the, that, that, these is the margins. You think back to the Ireland game first up for them. Um, you know, obviously, Peter O'Mahony gets uh, red carded. The England game, a couple of things go their way. Uh, and it swings and roundabouts. I said it before, didn't I? Swings and roundabouts. You make your luck. They had a load of luck. And unfortunately, I wanted the Welsh to win. I really did. Um, but they ran out of luck in the end. And a couple of things went against them. Whereas in other games, they've had things go for them. And that's the game. The positive thing for me around Wales was that they could have, should have won that game. Yeah. And on our, again, I don't know where this has come from, but I have to change my ways. I thought they were going to get hammered by France. I really did. The way that France played against England the week before, the quality of players that they've got. Do you know, here's a stat that I found, big shout out to Young Rugby's or whatever they're called on Instagram. France have the youngest profile of squad in the whole of the Six Nations. Yeah. 
were younger than Italy. Yeah, apparently so. Apparently, mm, France are the mm. are the youngest than Italy. I don't know. You just uh, Instagram. Whatever's on Instagram, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not going to be far off. Italy have gone young in the Six Nations. France are a young team in terms of age. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's frightening how good France could be. But also, you know, Wales will be massively disappointed. They had it in their own hands, didn't they? Especially when they had possession with a minute and a half to go. Um, so, yeah, mate, it's... France, we, we, we've known they've been... You know, they've, they've had this much potential now for... Well, basically since Sean Edwards walked up into the building and said, fucking smash them! Fucking hit some law! Fucking smash them! Um, and they've become a very good team, not only because of him, but also because of the talent that they've got at their disposal with, you know, DuPont and, and players like that. But, yeah, Wales will be gutted, won't they? It will, people are saying it will take them years to get over this. It won't, because they've come from the doldrums of where they were this time last year, and they were bang average this time last year, and... Uh, in the Autumn Nations Cup. And now they've got a lot of their players back into form and fitness. Um, as Wayne Pierback said, he's had a tough ride to start off with, but they're a decent team. Um, they'll be massively disappointed, but there's a lot of things to kick on from them. Hey, it's better off being a Welsh rugby player right now than an English rugby player. I'll tell you that for free. Let's have a look at that uh, yellow card, Goody. You touched on it. Should it have been a penalty try to Wales? This is Jim. Over to you, Jim, because that I see that as a fat fly off. I'm looking at that going, that is travelling at a rate of knots. And how Hawass hasn't been able to get all the way back round. He's basically covered and collapsed it. 100% yellow card. I'm saying penalty try, but Jim, you are the oracle on driving goers. Well, when it happened, I didn't think it was. So I didn't think you've got to go back for the penalty try. I think so much happened after that. So much time elapsed. How many phases? Do we know how many phases? Well, no, well, that, after? well this is the thing. So... What happened, Jim, is from that breakout, it's when Lewis Reece Summit does the ridiculous dive in the corner and they go so to the TMO to check it. And that's, I think, why it wasn't given as a penalty try. Yeah, of course. And that, that's what I mean. There was so much drama around that. I mean, just for the finish, I would have given it. I would have been like, this lad is, <laughs> is absolutely on fire. Who we should say is on the show next week, apparently. Looking so forward we'll to that. that. Yeah, no pressure. Don't do a Bill Beaumont and get your mates to force you to come on. But um, yeah, that's why. That's why I think it is a penalty try, in my opinion. And that's the one I would say. We could talk about Liam Williams if you, if you want. I said I disagree with Nigel Owens. You know, you can't do what it looked like he did and was whack the ball out of the pond's hands. It's like if he's whacked his arm, it's where he's come from. He's just he's dived over the rock. Like I, it, it's clumsy. You know, sometimes you get away with whacking the arm. I don't. Yeah. I don't think you should be allowed to do it. I don't think. You know, I don't. Yeah. The I think with the benefit of hindsight, which is what Nigel Owens has obviously seen, he's able to rewind button and everything like that. When you're looking at it, actually, I think DuPont spills the ball as he's about to be tackled. So it, Liam Williams is actually diving to try and tackle his feet. Um, and, you know, Nigel says he's perfectly uh, within the laws of the game to do that once the ball's lifted and he's, he's stepped away from the breakdown. Um, but yeah, I mean, listen, you, you can argue those things to you in the face. You've seen them given... Uh, as penalties and, you know, Wales are on enough warnings. The, the thing for Liam Williams is he didn't need to do it. Um, and I know there's been a massive fallout of all the abuse he's received on social media, which, again, is absolutely ridiculous. Um, but he'll be frustrated with himself because he didn't need to dive over the rock like that. Whether it's a, a yellow card and a penalty or not, obviously referees interpretation and that's what you're opening yourself up to. Imagine you, Jim, having hindsight of all the penos you gave away in your career. Like you could do a four year podcast just like relentlessly talking about all the pens and oh, I did that because of this. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, Paul Liam Williams, you, you know, you do feel for him, but then again, you question his decision making. Does he need to do it? Whenever a back three player is doing that, it also highlights it as well, doesn't it? Because you're not in that battle of a rock and it opens yourself up to being penalised. And unfortunately for Wales, that was the one that really opened up the edge. Uh, and if you want to go to some real detail, if you look at the last couple of phases before they scored the try. You've got all the backs. George North eventually gets out to the far side, but you've got all the backs. So you've got both wingers, Lewis Reece Summit and uh, Adams right by the touchline on the right-hand side. Um, their left, obviously, France's right-hand side. Halaholo is in there as well. Um, and Callum Sheedy's all around that breakdown. And when you're down to 13 men, you always need to try and have the pace on the outside. And unfortunately, Wales get caught out um, and couldn't close the game out a minute and a half before. So um, 
They could still win it though. Come on, Scotland. We want Scotland to do the Welsh a favour. Because no one wants the French to win, do they? Mm. <laughs> no, no, I, no, I'm not that confident for Scotland, but um, as much as I want them to win, yeah, we can do it. We can do it. We can do it. I know we can do it. We'll partner up with the awesome Pat Coffee guys again this week. If you haven't tried them yet, they deliver flexible and incredible tasting coffee plans directly to your door. They source the best coffee and pay coffee farmers above the fair trade baseline. There's no hidden postage charges. And if you order before 1 p.m. on Monday to Friday, your order will be with you the very next day. It's also letterbox friendly, so you don't need to be at home waiting for your coffee. And we've got a discount code for you as well to get your first bag from just £1.95. So just head to patcoffee.com, that's P-A-C-T coffee.com, and enter the code RUGBY at the checkout. The code is valid when you create a Pat Coffee plan. And so it's for new customers only, so it's definitely worth going to check out. Goody, what went wrong with England and Dublin? My word. Again, not just Dublin. What has gone wrong with them the whole joke? Second from bottom. They've done, <laughs> they've done an Italy, haven't they? Or a Scotland. I mean, we've done, we've done, we've done a from bottom. Mate, we've done a Scotland. Um, no, I mean, literally, no excuses. We got out muscled, out thought tactically. Um, you know, I've been saying Scrum. it for. Yeah, scrum got dominated at that set piece. Yeah, we lost our composure. Our kicking game was poor as it has been. Everything that everyone's been talking about just came back to it, right in the picture, didn't it? Because we beat France last week and that first half against France last week was brilliant. And then actually, when you look back on it, second half, we, you know, we, we get the victory towards the end. If we lost that game, and I said it last week, France had an opportunity at 20 points to 13 up to score. We lose that game. And then you're thinking, does that France victory mask what's gone on? Because Eddie Jones and the messages that are coming out of his mouth around, oh, we finished the Six Nations better than we started. No, we didn't, Eddie. We got hosed by Ireland and at the end, and at the start, we got hosed by Scotland. And I no, you got, you got obliterated by Scotland. You didn't get hosed. <laughs> you got absolutely obliterated by Scotland. So he's right. I believe that comment. What he said, I was nodding. <laughs> I was like, if I don't believe you about anything else, Eddie, I believe you on that note. But it, it boils back to what everyone's been saying, right? And I said at the start, you can only really judge. And we said it after the first game. You can only really judge on team selection whether all the boys that hadn't played much rugby should have been playing after a game. And against Scotland, most of the Saracens boys, bar Marrow, were bang average uh, that are in the team. A third of your team, that is, because there was five of them. Um, and, you know, people uh, people think it's a bandwagon for the likes of Marcus Smith and um, Sam Simmons and Alex Dombrandt. These boys are bang in form and it just shows you. Eddie Jones thought that these guys, he can train them up to the intensity that you need to play international rugby. It's our worst Six Nations ever. You know, we finished fifth. Yeah, yeah. The, only, the only other time we finished fifth was 2018 <laughs> under Eddie Jones. Mate, I played for England and I was I was uh, not even bang average. I was shite. Played for England. We didn't finish worse than fourth, I don't think, when I played. Um, you know, we've won... You only played one Six Nations. I played three. I played three, actually, James. Um, oh, did you? Okay, sorry. Yeah, Long I did. Uh, never lost to Scotland either. Um, you know, our discipline was... I think our discipline record, we gave the most penalties away ever in a Six Nations. Um, so bad. Equal to Italy. Shocking. Uh, we conceded the most points we've ever, ever conceded Awful. in a Six Awful. Nations. <laughs> um, and our attack was, apart from 40 minutes against France, our attack was pretty bang average. Um, France who were coming right just off COVID, so they were all crook. Yeah, yeah. Plus France you should have lost to Italy as well. Very true. Italy oh, the, got robbed. There was, a, there was a turning point in the Italy game when Farrell uh, put his shoulder into the into the back of the scrum half and then we intercept and go the length when actually um, no nah, listen we were never going to lose to it. It, it there's a massive massive question mark everyone's been asking the questions but Eddie's relied on our oh, mate we made the World Cup 2019 the final mate we were, and yes we won the Six Nations last year and we won the Autumn Nations Cup but we've been on this decline everyone's been saying it except for Eddie Jones um, he talks about we're going through a transition period what transition period are we going on about Eddie a transition period I'll tell you when a transition period was after we won the World Cup in 2003 and all those boys retired, a transition period is when shags like me got to play. That's a transition period, right? The boys in the England squad, 
11 of them, I think, started the World Cup final in 2019. So that ain't a transition period, Eddie. Uh, my transition um, period with England was uh, under 21s level where Stuart Hooper got picked <laughs> ahead of me and I transitioned up to Scotland become an absolute hero. <laughs> with a 15% win, and win success oh, rate. It doesn't matter. All I know is <laughs> yeah. that England finished second from bottom and Scotland could potentially finish second. Yeah! Yeah, no, yeah you're right. Uh, but here's the big thing. So it's always been Eddie, Eddie's way or the highway, right? We know he's an autocratic kind of leader. Uh, anyone that questions him, uh, you know, falls by the wayside. Danny Kerr went and had a one-on-one -on -one with him and, and asked him some questions around why he couldn't play with the starting team. Never seen again. You know, there was a number of players that's happened to. Chris Ashton didn't want to be in the squad because he didn't like the environment and it was Eddie's way of the highway. And I get, listen, coach is prerogative. But when you finish fifth and had your worst ever Six Nations and, um, you know, there's going to be a review, Eddie Jones has got complete autonomy. Look at the turnover of coaches Look at the turnover of backroom staff that have been there in his six-year tenure so far. And you look at it, and he did an interview with Lawrence Dalio um, a couple of years ago, and he said where he got it wrong with Australia is he overstayed what he should have done. He should have been there four years and left. It's a four-year cycle, mate, the window, mate, of when an international coach can have the big... That's gone. Um, but he's... I don't know. It, I did some... Uh, a virtual... Q&A over the weekend with a couple of lads over in Ireland and Gordon Darcy was one of them and he actually said I didn't think it was possible to dislike the English anymore but then they put Eddie Jones as the head coach and it makes it even greater to dislike England so um, yeah mate back to the drawing board and I said it you, you know George Ford shouldn't be in that England squad on form there's a lot of players that shouldn't be in that England squad on form yet they still get picked um, and there needs to be a massive overhaul I think of of staff um, you've got your attack coaches and no disrespect to these guys Simon Amor has been in the sevens game for many many years never coached at 15s and I don't mean to be I'm not blaming them how are they going to challenge Eddie Jones in Eddie Jones's environment and say we should be picking Marcus Smith or we need to attack a different way or you know stop kicking it away they haven't got the power to because Eddie Jones shouts people down uh, and they're just happy to keep their job. So it's it's an environment that, that isn't, um, for me, from the outside looking in, it's not a high-performance environment. It's an Eddie Jones environment that, you know, tries to work everyone to the bone. Uh, and you see it in the players. Players didn't look energised, did they? Started okay for 15 minutes, and then we look like we absolutely... Just don't, just don't look very good. Just yeah. it's, it's cra when I'm watching it, it's crazy, because I'm looking at it, and you, you crash ball... Is Faz, is Farrell going up as your crash ball? Who's a slender 10? Yeah. And like you're doing a switch move, you get an out up. The celebrations are around Farrell putting Bundiaki into touch with Johnny May just. And then apart from that, I don't, you know, Marrow stand out, really. I don't see, you know, Anthony Watson saw glimpses against France where he looked yeah. class. Harry. Um, yeah, sorry, yeah, good point. Yeah, Curry. Yeah, good point. Curry looks good. But apart from that, and again, look, I can say this because I'm mates with some of the lads in the team. Well, I was until I maybe say this. A large part of it, I think, revolves around the Saracens thing and what's happened to Saracens. I've spoken about it before, the backbone of the team, the emotion around that. No fans in stadiums, which everyone has got and everyone's managed to deal with. But Eddie's mentioned that and said that that's a thing. Faz being captain, I personally don't think he's the right guy. And then... What are the team and Delalio and whatever the you know, someone like Lawrence Delalio says the statement where it's, it's harder to get dropped from the England squad. That's Delalio saying that this is a guy that put his heart and soul into the England shirt. He is well placed to be able to see that, but it's the truth. You look at it like there's lads in that team that are, just aren't playing well for, for whatever reason. It's a closed shop, and you're talking about one of the best rugby teams in the world the biggest pool of players, the richest union, the best players to choose from. And I'm watching it and, and they were poo. I don't, and it, you know, David Walsh brought out um, a piece at the weekend, Goody, and there was parts of it where I was like, he was right. I'm, we're newish into the media. I'm newish into the media. And it's easy just to let things roll off the tongue. Sexton's done. Alan Wynne Jones shouldn't be captain. Eddie Jones shouldn't be England coach. And I regret some of the things I've said. <laughs> and look who looks stupid now. And when I, I left David a, a, a voice note today. When I think back on it, I kind of say things emotion-driven, but also opinion-driven, but then looking at the lay of the land. Was I wrong on Sexton? 
arguably, yes, you could say he's the starting Lions 10 now. Alan Wynne Jones, you could arguably say he's Lions <laughs> captain, no biggie. But I can't stand with it when with Eddie Jones. It's like you're the head, not just of England, but of these premiership clubs in terms of managing the, these players, managing their expectations. And none of them, none of them, none of the players that are playing well. Look at Sam Simmons. You can see he is livid, right? And is he deluded? No, because you've got people like Delalio, you've got Jono, Hamilton, you've got three legends <laughs> saying that he should be in and around the squad, and he's not. He's not even in the squad. And I, I tell you, it was nice to see George Martin come on for England, running around. I thought, he, you know, he looked good. He, he put a really good shot when he came on. How have you got George Martin coming on to the pitch? No disrespect. I wanted to. I want to see him get two hundred caps for England. Saw him play for the academy. How have you got him coming on ahead of someone like Sam Simmons? Yeah. I know it's obviously you know in, in, in the second row or or what have you, but how he's earned his opportunity. You've got someone like Sam Simmons covered. Again, we can labour this point good yeah. if we can, but well, like, well, yeah, the big that, debate on, will be. I was going to say, on that point, um, Eddie Jones doesn't speak to some of the Premiership directors of rugby, and I know that for a fact. He hasn't spoken to them in months, so he doesn't talk to them about the players. Um, and when you say it's Eddie's way or the highway, that's it. He doesn't, you see him at Premiership games, but he doesn't value, clearly doesn't value form in the Premiership, and he said that. He, he, all What's he the point then? Yeah, all he values in his mind is what he thinks he sees in a player in his environment. And, um, you know, when you're the boss, you've got every right to pick whoever you want. But when you finish fifth in the Six Nations, is it sackable? Well, I tell you now, if it wasn't Eddie Jones and it wasn't um, the situation we're in now with COVID and um, the financial ramifications, if there was another option to go to and it was anyone else, they'd get sacked. You know, you think back to Stuart Lancaster, end of the World Cup. Um, Stuart Lancaster finished second, I think, in three consecutive Six Nations or something along those lines. Jono. Jono got, won the Six Nations. Yeah. Yeah. And got to a World Cup quarter final, got sacked. So, you know, it's... I, I don't know. Eddie Jones is going to be here for until 2023. That's when He's got a break clause in his contract. No, yeah, but there's no... The, the, I mean, he's got a break clause in his contract, but then you're looking at it on, around performance, but you're looking at where'd you go? So... The obvious candidate in the in England is Rob Baxter. Is he going to leave Exeter now? He said no. He's Do you think they spoke to him? Do you think they speak to him? to him or not? Do you think he's, he's no had a conversation or no. not? No. And, and, and this is the thing, when you go, like Bill Sweeney, who's the CEO of, of the RFU, says they're going to do a review. We need to know who's on that review team. We, you need some rugby I, IQ in there where they can, Jim's putting his hands up, where you can you know understand environments, you can understand what winning looks like in an England shirt. Tick, tick. You know, in an international jersey. Um, you know, what they're going to do, I think, is do a review, come out and say, yeah, we're all going to work harder, get better. But the, the, the usual taglines. But Eddie Jones needs to be held accountable for absolutely everything. At the minute, he's just got free reign. What he came out with at the back end of last week around uh, the press of rat poison getting in their heads, in the players' heads, I'm sat there going, what are you on about? Well, Eddie, you're an absolute clown sometimes, but other times you're obviously, you know, top end at understanding how to read a situation. He misreads more situation than he, situations than he reads, Eddie Jones. And, you know, it, you need accountability. There's no accountability. Which coaches are going to stand up to Eddie Jones and go, mate, we're doing this wrong, we need to change this. Um, we should be picking these premiership players and think that that's how ridiculous it's become. Um, the fact that the guys that are playing exceptionally well aren't even close. Um, yeah, Eddie Jones will go away and pick a George Martin. And I hate, as Jim does, you don't want to single out him. Does he, on performance, deserve to be in the England squad? Absolutely not. Are we delighted that he's got his first cap? 100%. And you, you can never take that away from someone. But anyone in their right mind is saying that Don Brandt, Simmons, these sort of players are short, head and shoulders above George Martin. Yet yeah, Eddie Jones refuses to pick them because there's this press bandwagon that say... They're on form, they should be picked. And he's like, no, nah, mate, this is my team. It's my team, my way. You don't even know nothing about internet. My. So, you know, it's 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 disheartening from an England fan. And there's millions of England fans out there that are so kind of disenfranchised now with the England team because of Eddie Jones and the way he's running it, that um, you're probably glad, and they're probably glad, there's no spectators in the stadium at the minute because they'd be getting pelters. Well, if 
as Eddie Jones says, they are resetting. What players is he resetting? Who's going to go? Oh, headlines. Oh, I, oh, gosh, Andy Rowe, mate. The scrum's an issue. So how do you look at that? England scrum's an issue. Okay, so take from that what you will. And I feel awful saying it. Um, what, what are you saying, Jim? Mako's done. I, I don't think he's done, but you, you, you've got to have a scrum. You know, or uh, at least have a relationship with the referees around the scrum. Mako, for whatever reason, whether or not it's right or wrong, there was definitely a couple of times where Furlong was pulling out on the set when the scrum engaged and uh, Mako was getting pinged. And we saw the World Cup final around that as well. You know, Marla's a fantastic scrummager, but Mako does so much around the pitch. Mm. But off the back of that, you know, well, Genji... Genji came on and got hosed in that scrum, didn't he? Uh, in the second half when... Tyg Furlong's given it the big fucking licks and deservedly so. I mean, he is, he's got skinnier arms than me, arguably, Tyg <laughs> Furlong, but he can skip and dance, it doesn't matter. Uh, who else? Who else is there? I mean, Will Mate, George, Wilson, Ford, Mate. George, George Ford, got to go. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, Marcus Smith is playing ridiculously well and we need yeah. to see other people in these opportunities. Like, you've got, you know, there's, there's never really been looking outside of his circle, right? So... Jim's going through the forwards and you mentioned that. George Ford goes missing in big games. Look at him at the weekend. So I read somewhere before the game and someone, I can't remember where I read it, but someone said, oh, it's a straight shootout between Sexton and George Ford for the Lions. I'm like, We're sort of, what sort of clowns were in that? George Ford isn't anywhere near close to it. It might watch. have been me. It might have been me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you, you're talking about Lions fly halves. So you've got obviously Sexton, Farrell, Bigger. And, Called it, Sexton. Um, Called Finn, it. Finn, Called and it Finn, 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 Finn Russell as well. Different fly halves for different reasons. But, you know, you need to see Marcus Smith. We've never had a, um, you know, a scrum half come through since Danny Kerr's gone and to challenge Ben Youngs. So we need to see the likes of Harry Randall. We need to see Ben Spencer. We need to see Dan Robson. Not just give them 10 minutes here or there. And this is the big thing about a regeneration. I'm not saying bin any players off. What we need to see is other people given the opportunity. And that's what's not happened. So Mark Wilson, um, you know, I love Wilkes, played with him at Newcastle. Great bloke, works harder than anyone I've ever seen in my life. Um, you know, but do we need to see Don Brandt or Simmons given an opportunity? How long can Wilkes go on for at that level? I'm not writing him off. He should, I'm not saying these players should never play for England again, but we want to and need to see other people given the opportunity. So there's obviously, you know, potential end of season tour where we might go to USA and Canada. It's not been announced yet, but obviously all COVID related, they'll get an opportunity then, but it's, then you go into the, the autumn where, you know, I think we play three games. I think we play South Africa, Australia and um, a yet to be named uh, tier two nation, I think. So. That could be England. That tier two nation could be England. <laughs> could no? be, it could be now. We might join Scotland in tier two, the way we're playing. Um, <laughs> we yeah, should talk of Ireland though, shouldn't we, Andrew? I mean, yeah, we yeah, can't... Mate. Well, we're talking about England because, you know, that, that's where the question came from. Ireland were phenomenal. Um, you know, August uh, Henshaw. Mate, Henshaw's not only he's, he's a big boy, powerful, defensive reads were great. Um, you know, Sexton, let's, you know, Conor Murray and Sexton, people have written them off. Jim Hamilton's written Sexton off time after time. I'm sorry. The way he controlled the game and the balance of play uh, and mixing the kicking game, stepping up at first receiver, not taking the world on himself allowing the big ball players to run. His kicking game was on point. So it's not just about a kicking game. It's about the accuracy of the kick. Um, their control was Keith, phenomenal. You Keith know. Earls, one of Keith. the most underrated players in international rugby. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, Conan at number eight, the hands for that try, where it's he's probably got about five millimetres above Curry, but he's got the dexterity and the Gaelic football skills, whatever, call it what you will just to pat it back down. And it was a planned move. They probably knew if, you, if you've got a name called Conan, Jack Conan and the Barbarians, you best be good. Yeah. You can't be you can't be Conan and be shit. And he is good. Do you see him in the wide channels as well? How quick he is I, and how well he carries in those wider channels. Yeah, I've seen him for Leinster. He's, yeah. in, he's class. Yeah, the lads yeah. Talk, talk about him highly. So. Yeah. But you, you talk about that try with Keith Earls, who played exceptionally well. Why, why have they spotted that? So they've spotted that because they take out the hooker, so Luke Cowan-Dickey has to go and defend with George Ford because they know that's a massive weakness. 
Um, so he defends tight to George Ford. That means that Ben Young's, the scrum off, is in the channel at the front of the line out. Curry was at the back of the line out. He's gone on the overshoot on the inside. Who's there? Billy Vanapola and Mako are the two guys. They've obviously seen this weakness. And the weakness is because Luke Cowan Dickey, the hooker, has to go and defend with George Ford because they know he's a defensive weak spot. Um, and, they, and they know England will compete in the line out as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, you know, Ireland were brilliant. Uh, and it's not all about England being bad. England were bad because Ireland made them look bad, you know, at set piece. Um, you know, the breakdown, their physicality, the, you know, the accuracy of tipping the ball on and around contact, um, you know, just the game management, the kicking accuracy when, you know, they're putting the ball up, their aerial skills. You, know, you see um, Keenan take the ball above Elliot Daly. That was good. That, that was that, good. That try had everything. So it had offloading, it had, uh, you know, attack where you're tipping on and into space, you know, a load of big, powerful ball carries at the game line, the perfect kick from Sexton, the unbelievable skill from Keenan to take it. Um, and then they recycle the ball play again. They don't look for the miracle straight away. And then Conan sees the space and, you know, he's on the outside anyway, make, makes a few yards, sees the space for the Jim Hamilton picking you for the try. Here we go. Yeah, Keenan looks like my mate Kovskin. Genuinely, looks like he's just walked in off the screen. <laughs> like, he's unbelievable. With Ireland as well, I think the emotion around CJ Stander uh, retiring as well, um, which, again, I'm still surprised about. Um, and the fact that they've got strength in depth now as well. Look at Ian Henderson. He's so good. Ian yeah. Henderson and Ty Byrne. My Ty Byrne. Mate. My God, Ty Byrne it was ridiculous in everything. Like, um, yeah, Van der Fleer came in the back row as well and, and ripped one off Billy. You know, Ty Byrne. And you, talk about this, Jim. So from the kickoff, when Ty Byrne goes around the back and steals it. How good's that? People are looking, your average fans are looking at that going, oh, he's offside, but they're not, are they? No, just it's clever, not that, clever uh, tactical play, right? Well, either it's a planned move or they know that they kicked it there and he's just read it well because it's a tackle. So if there's no other players that have um, hit Marrow as he's taken it, it's a tackle. So he can come around, there's no offside line. So yeah, just smart. I think it, it, their tackle selection, you know, we saw uh, Robbie Henshaw holding players up in the tackle just I, I just thought they played really really well and I don't I, I don't know whether it's because England was so poor because again without going back to England they were so poor against Scotland they weren't great against Italy you look at I'm sure we're going to talk about it Scotland's team run Scotland put 52 points on the Italians 52 points um, so I don't know fair play to Ireland is all I'm saying and it's yeah. going to be interesting now because there is a Lions tour. We've seen Gats up in the crowd. It looks like Gats with his eyes. Um, I should know. But because before this, you would have said that the backbone of that Lions tour, because Wales were ageing, because Sexton was finished. What are you on about? Exactly. What am I on about? Because Scotland the poo, even though we could finish second. After these England lads that we thought were going to go, you, you think if you're going to talk about it and what Gatland picks on, they're not going to go. I just hope that Gatland doesn't do an Eddie Jones and go with what he thinks might work against South Africa, which there will be an element of that. And he actually goes with some of the lads like Ty Byrne, they're all talking up, like him who have performed in this championship. Well, someone that we, you've mentioned already that maybe on the plane or the car or wherever it is, is uh, one of the form players of the tournament. He can give us an insight into the Irish camp. Ty Byrne joins us now. How are you, mate? Yeah, good. Very good. Thanks for having me. So thanks for coming on, mate. A couple of days after that test match. Let's just get one thing straight, okay? And either way, you're going to have to agree with us. You're a friend of the show. You're a big listener of the pod, aren't you? That's what I'm hearing from your mates. They're telling me. Yeah, massive listener. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be on Spotify next year anyway. So just to let you know, I don't think we got the big news last week. Jeez, congrats. Well, I do I do see uh, the odd time that you're, you're number one or number two in the L.A. Uh, the sports podcast so you're obviously doing something right that's for sure yeah no yeah thanks for having you coming on tonight's class mate yeah, yeah it certainly is it certainly is let's talk through Saturday then uh, as an Englishman um, it was hard watching from from our point of view but the Ireland team the Ireland squad especially off the back of the the last four games that uh, England have played against Ireland when we seem to have had the wood over you um, it went perfectly to plan right because you boys absolutely took us to the cleaners yeah look it went, it went obviously very well for us it's um I think it was a massive week for us um, as, as a squad. You know, we probably spoke a lot about 
building on their performances after the first two losses of the campaign and then um, with CJ's announcement that was kind of a little bit of extra in, uh, I suppose motivation for everyone to kind of finish finish off with a big with a big game for him um, you know he's been a massive servant to the green jersey so for us to, to put in the performance um, like we did at the end was was great for him too yeah did that come as a bit of a, a shock his announcement it kind of well it took me a bit for, a, by surprise especially with how well that he's playing I mean were the whispers in in, in the squad uh, no. that that could potentially happen no um, it was very much on the on the QT um, you know he 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 had, you know, with CJ, sometimes he, he was saying he was leaving, but like joking half, like he'd always laugh afterwards. But then um, he was playing, keeping his cards uh, close to his chest for sure. Um, we all thought he was spoofing, to be honest, whenever he did say that. He was like, oh, I don't know what I'll do next year. Um, so, yeah, it was a big shock. Like, a lot, like I think I'd say probably 95% of the lads in the Irish um team where like when he stood up to make a team announcement no one was actually I was actually expecting him to come out and say he was retiring so um yeah it was a bit of an emotional one for for everyone and uh yeah sort of would be sad to see him go but what a career yeah he seems to be really well liked within the squad and I think externally when he initially got announced in the Irish squad and you and you hear a bit about his backstory it's coming coming to Munster not being in the squad can't barely speak English or or Irish, but you look at the emotion around the players that have for him. He seems like a really well liked guy in the squad. Yeah, and I'd say it, it comes down to his work work right. Like he's uh, he he leaves everything out there every time he plays, you know. And he's bought massively into the monster culture and the Irish culture, and I think that's probably just why he's gelled so well with everyone. And um, you know, he's an absolute gentleman off the field. Um, he'd have time for anyone. Um, you'd see him talking to everyone and anyone um, on the streets and everything. So uh, he's just one of those people who's who's just got a really good nature about him. Yeah, he sounds like a good bloke. But did you actually think it was banter that he was just trying to get his contract up a bit higher by saying, um, yeah, we like, <laughs> yeah, we were staggering. Uh, right. we, we, we thought he was holding out just to scare, as a scare tactic, but... Uh, <laughs> 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 Fair play to him. Fair. Well, let's talk about the game then. Obviously, um, tactically, uh, where did you look to target England? Because there were clearly, you know, it was a massive uh, difference in the performances from Ireland of the, over the last few years against England. Set piece was huge. The line out tactically was was brilliant to to the big parts that you played in that. Um, can you give us some insight into where you targeted England? Um, I think and credit to the coaches, you know, they came up with that play, um, the the one where Earlsy scored. Um, kind of seen a seen a bit of a like a bit of space in that area, and you know that couldn't have worked any better for us. Um, we you know we came back on one of our plays as well, um, back against the grain, and I think Handy made a bit of a break there as well. So you know they they did their homework, and they certainly our uh, our set piece uh, delivered um, in that area. And then, other than that, it was just for us. It was just kind of just about being about being direct and not being afraid to play. You know, I think the last time we played them, we weren't. We weren't, um, I don't think we were a bit too, uh, you know, I suppose we were just one-off carries and we weren't given the passes as if we were we were almost afraid to tip the ball on or throw that 10-metre that pass for the backs and stuff. So we have a big emphasis this week on not being afraid to play and just just going after the game. And obviously we, we managed to do that. I think we had a bit of a uh, dodgy first 20 minutes, but once we got going, um, we were pretty pleased. Yeah, it certainly, yeah. it certainly worked. One of the things that you might need to improve on, and it's not a playing side, it's more the social media, because I've seen an interview with Simon Easterby that's come out when pre match <laughs> they're practicing the line out that Elsie scores the try off anyway. So England didn't pick that up, but no. the social media guy needs to work on his game and not put the best move in the back. Yeah, we only found that out when we're uh, after the game, someone said it, and we were just laughing about it. We were usually very tidy and that kind of stuff in terms of not showing anything. So. I'd say someone might get a slap on the wrist for that one. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of talk as well, Ty, when you play against England, any team, it's about the physicality. You mentioned um, the physicality of them. We saw the game last year as well. Do you go into that game a little bit scared about how physical they can be, knowing that you need to be physical, but you need a bit of innovation? We spoke about the line out off the kickoff as well, the turnover you got on Marrow, are your potential Lions vice captain, if you're captain, uh, on this tour. But um, like, what is the build-up to the England game? Is, is is there that added kind of 
tactics around their physicality, but trying to be innovative as well, and it all paid off. Paul O'Connor, we'll give him a shout out. <laughs> I wouldn't say scared. That's probably a strong word. Like, uh, if you're going into any game scared, you probably shouldn't be playing in it. Really, that's uh, why I retired because I was scared <laughs> by the I was scared by the end, mate. Mate, you, you haven't played with Jim Hamilton as you said. Come on, I'm scared he gave twenty penalties away a game when I played with him. <laughs> Ty's played. You've played against me, haven't you, Ty? I remember playing against you. I don't know if you remember playing against me. You, you don't have a clue. You, you, there's no way if you did play against me, you remember playing against me. <laughs> <laughs> I booked in you uh, down the street. You didn't have a clue who I was. Completely, like, that was well, it's because you know. you've got a scrum, a scrum cap on. I remember I had this lad in Ireland nodding at me. He was just nodding at me. And it was like, I couldn't work. I was like, is that it? He knows me. He knows me. And then now, now, now that you've made it and you've got four or five man of the matches in a row, I know you. I know who you are. You know me. So, But how is it playing time in the team? Paul O'Connell's come in, a bit of innovation around. And you can see it's easy to say, oh, Ireland's line out's good. Paul O'Connell's come in, that's the reason why. But you've got some quality players in that, quality yeah. line-out forwards. But the innovation as well, obviously, we mentioned Keith Hill's tribe. But what's um, Paulie added to the squad? You know, he came in and uh, he very much, he sat us down. I think we had a bit of, he called us in for a meet. We must have been in there for almost three hours talking just about line-outs. Um, he was just kind of getting a feel for how we did things before he arrived. And I think from the first week to the last week, just... Each week, he kind of brought in what he was he his own his own stamp on a few things. Um, so at the start, it was very much let us control it, see how we got on, and then uh, as he went on, he brought he he kind of came into it a lot more, and because he didn't want to throw too much uh, too much at us from the get go. Um, but as the weeks went on, and I think you've probably seen that our line out improved um, as as it went on, especially defensively as well. It was really good and. You know, with Cheese and um, sorry, James Ryan and Ian Henderson, the two of them, they're really intelligent. You know, uh, James Ryan is, is is very smart in terms of coming up with uh, line-out plans defensively and then, um, you know, Henderson in terms of attack. So, you know, b- between the two of them and Paul O'Connell, I think, uh, you know, our line was pretty strong this, this campaign. Yeah, it certainly was. Um, there's been a bit of chat in the Irish press as well around a bit of pressure on the coaches and obviously moving on from Joe Schmidt and the changes that have been made. Um, you only kind of see differences when you're inside the circle, right? When you're in the squad and how things are evolving. And it's easy for press and people to jump on a bandwagon once you've lost to Wales and France. But you yeah. guys could see clearly, um, you know, the differences that were being made in camp. And do, do you think the result at the weekend, the performance really just goes to show that, um, you know, these guys are the right guys to lead the squad forward and, you know, there is massive progress? Absolutely, yeah. I think um, you know. I think w- w- the squad we have in there, like there, there's an incredible bunch of talent in there, and uh, the players that are playing there, are seriously, seriously good. You know, I don't. I just think at times it wasn't clicking for us. And in fairness to Faz and to, and the rest of the coaching staff, like they they kept like making small adjustments and trying to. Get their stamp on it, and I think as the as we played more, we we were a bit more on par, and what they were looking for, and we were getting there. And um, look, I think they're going to bring even more as the uh, as um as they continue coaching Ireland. I think we're only going to get better from here. And talking of better, you must be happy with the way you're playing. You must be satisfied with your performances. I'm only joking. You must be. Very, very happy. I don't know whether you read or you listen to the hype. You know, your mates must tell you, your family must tell you, everyone's talking about you at the minute. And, you know, that's credit to the way that you're playing. You go about your business quietly. You pick up your man of the matches after and just give a few lines and go home and rock up the next week and do it all again. But like, do you feel that around the media? Do you, do you feel the um, the momentum gathering of people talking about you? It'd be lying if I said I didn't. Um, you try to avoid it as much as you can, you know, I think... Probably if you just asked me this probably two years ago, three years ago, I'd probably be listening to everything. But um, as you learn, it kind of can get in your head a little bit and you almost avoid it as much as you can then. Um, so, but of course, you know, like parents and stuff would obviously be, be reading up on every single thing they can and trying to play it. <laughs> I'm just like, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, look, in terms of personally, look, my target going into the Six Nations was... Just to try and get into the starting to the starting team, you know, I I haven't ever had a run of games of starting with Ireland, and to be honest, I didn't think 
when I was going into going into the start of the Six Nations, I uh, I knew Ian Henderson was back fit, so my presumption was that I'd probably be 24, 24 man again because Quinn Rue. Nothing did. wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because like, Quinn Rue was there as well, and then unfortunately for him, he had, he picked up a bit of a knock, so he had to go home. And um, to my surprise, I was told I was going to be starting the first game, and uh, you know, I knew it was a massive opportunity, and um, I just did everything I could to try and keep my place and thankfully for for me um, I managed to manage to do that and continue to do that throughout Six Nations and obviously I'm, that's what I'm most pleased about is that I managed to put in performances good enough to retain my my, my spot. <coughs> yeah I don't think mate it's just about retaining your spot you were phenomenal and you were that good basically Jim and I are going to name you Lions captain um, on this podcast <laughs> but don't read it don't listen to it um, as we know you do one of the ones uh, I want to talk about there is a Lions tour coming up of course and you can't get away from that and I know you're going to say it would be a dream to get on it but your versatility playing back row and second row um, I'm looking my partner in crime Jim Hamilton he was an international second row, but he could never have played in the back row. Uh, which one do you prefer? Are you bothered where you play? Um, and is there, you know, much of a difference these days because the athleticism mm. of second rows is, is very similar to back rows of old, isn't it? Yeah, I, like, I would say there's a difference. And, like, I think it's very much, if you if you ask me if I prefer second row or back row, in the systems that I do play at the moment, I prefer second row purely because... I feel I can get involved in the game a little bit more. Um, now that's not to say in a different like system in terms of like I don't know if you were to play for England or Scotland or something that they may have a different kind of way that they want the six to play. So you might be involved even more than the second rows. But at the moment, I definitely do prefer playing in the row purely because I feel like I can kind of get myself involved into the game earlier and um, get my hands on the ball and stuff. So. Yeah, probably second round, put it down to. <laughs> well, Warren will be listening to this and it'll be great to know that he knows now that second row is your preferred position. He was in camp <laughs> he, he was in camp with you lads last week. Did you have a, a nod at him? Did he look at you? Did he chat to you or was it just <laughs> head down? You must have looked at him. When he was in training, you must have looked at him to see if he'd give you a nod. That's what I did. But in 2013, he didn't look at me. But... <laughs> no, I don't take that uh, No, I turned to, to Warren. He came in and he, he had a little chat in the in the huddle after the after training, but that's all we pretty much seen of him. He kind of he he was watching from the sideline with our um, team manager, and then afterwards he kind of went off with the coach and staff. So we didn't have much exchanges with him at all. Yeah, fair Hopefully play. It's for the best. <laughs> yeah, t- tough one to answer that because we know um, there's going to be so many questions coming up over the next couple of months around selection and everything. But uh, no rest of the wicked, really, because you had a massive performance against England at the weekend. This weekend, you go into the Guinness Pro 14 final uh, against your big rivals, Monster against Leinster. Um, yeah. <laughs> straight back into, you've gone into battle with them. Now you're going to go to battle against them this weekend. You're looking forward to that? Yeah, big time. I thought it was a bit strange when everyone was leaving on Sunday morning. Where majority of us were like, "Yeah, we'll see you next week." So um, it's a uh, it's a bit of a strange one, but look, it's it's a massive opportunity for Munster. I think it's probably our first. Uh, it's a proper opportunity for us to win silverware for the first time in what, ten years. I think it is. So um, there's a lot of lads uh, chomping at the bit to 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 play next weekend, and hopefully we'll be able to to finally lift the trophy. Well, big shout out to Graham Roundtree, Wiggs Billy as well. Give him a hello from us. He's listening to the show, so he'll be listening to this anyway. We know what the crack is. <laughs> How are you getting on with Graham Roundtree, actually? Because, um, you know, obviously we, we know him pretty well. He's a good coach, good bloke. Um, he's got some horrific ears, but any any nicknames going down for him in Ireland? Uh, no, just call it just Wig, really. He, he goes with that. Um, but, yeah, no, he's class coach, in fairness to him. I, He's been a massive help to me as well since he's come in. Um, and I, he's really bought into it. I think he loves it here. So I don't think he'll be gone anywhere for a while. Um, but yeah, he's an absolute legend. Great yeah, player. he is. He certainly is. And one thing he doesn't like being called is Wiggy. Yeah. So um, if you call him Wiggy, mate, just do it with a smile. I said, Goody says, call you Wiggy. I guarantee <laughs> I tell that fucking to fuck off. 
Yeah, I think a few of the lads picked up on that in the first couple of months he was here, and then he just heard a few lads at the back of the meeting and be like, cheers, Wiggy, boy. <laughs> it, it is weird, though, isn't it? He doesn't like being called Wiggy, yeah, but he yeah. loves being called Wigs, Billy. Like... <laughs> uh, yeah. Definitely. Good exactly. stuff. All right, Ty, well, thank you very much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Uh, hell of a tournament. Well done yeah. on that, and best of luck uh, in the Pro 14 final against Leinster this weekend. Top low, top lad. Top bloke. Absolute top bloke. Imagine what a that. Player. Like you've, yeah. I mean, what a player, but what a bloke for coming on as well. We, we, as we know, we've said here, here, here before, a lot of the unions are very protective. They're like, no, you can't go on this. You can't do that. They media controlled. Um, fair play. He's top of the world at the minute because he's played exceptionally well for Ireland. They've just dominated England and he just wants to come on the pod. And he's got he a knows Pro me. 14 he knows final. Me, that's why. Yeah. He's got a Pro 14 final this weekend. Mate, how bad are you? You thought you were that big time. You, you're walking down the street and didn't even give Tad Byrne the nod and go, yeah, future Lions captain right there. I was being that... overwhelmed with pictures, pictures <laughs> and autographs. And it was a bit weird because I was outside the Island Hotel. I don't know why I found myself there. I was trying to get away from Johnny Sexton because I knew he was after me. And uh, yeah, and he looks at me and nodded, but I'm a massive fan of his. I didn't want to fanboy him too much, but he is... You, you talk about taking your opportunity, right? And he said it there. He was worried about being the 24th man. You know, trying to get into the squad. Quinn Rue being injured. You know, Henderson's been injured, obviously, before he's come back in. I mean, Ian Henderson's quality as well. He's going to go yeah. on the Lions tour as well. But the fact that Ty, whether or not he likes it or not, has played six, and you've got Mara who can play in that role as well. Obviously, Courtney Norris is injured at the minute. And we know that Warren likes that type of player. He's in, mate. It just, mate, I mean, name Skips. your position. Skips. Name your position. Yeah, why not? Who else can be skips? Why not? <laughs> um, Wales lost, so Alan Wynne Jones can't be skipping now. But um, yeah, fantastic player, uh, the modern day athlete, the humility, and he's a rugby pod listener. So uh, I love him. <laughs> You're going to fanboy him for life now, aren't you? Well, we've wrapped up the Six Nations now for the weekend, unless you want to talk about Scotland and Italy, Jim. What do you mean, uh, what do you mean unless we want to talk about them? It's. We put 52 points, the biggest winning margin for Scotland ever against Italy. Probably the biggest win by any team in the Six Nations against Italy. Don't quote me on that, it's obviously not. But my goodness me, it was a team run. And Italy started well as well. I was scared, I'll be honest. I was, I was a little scared. And then, again, because of the comments I've made in recent weeks, I was scared. Why? 50. Oh, Ravos. Ah, oh, they got Ravos. Italy did. It was a team run. I don't know what more to say. It was, I mean, if Italy, there were questions, and I'm, I was supporting them all tournaments, saying they were playing good rugby, young squad. Who gets fifty? Uh, get, especially Italy. against Scotland. Especially against Scotland. Especially against a team that could finish second in the Six Nations. So arguably, <laughs> you could see why. You could see why they might get fifty foot on them, or it's fifty-two. But. Uh, yeah. I was happy for Scotland. We know it, you know, it's tough on a six-day turnaround. Hoggy, big shout out to Hoggy. He wore his custom budgie smugglers um, in the match. The lucky pants he showed me before. Um, I said, can I put it on social? He said, no, just in case we don't put 50 on them. We did, and then I forgot to tweet it. So Because I haven't got a blue tick, no one would have seen it. But uh, Hoggy slotted into 10. It's a good yeah. option for us. Um, what else have we got that we could talk about? Darcy um, Graham play well. Yeah, Darcy Graham, quality player. Hugh Jones at 13. How quick? Just for, he's, he's one of these players, right? Internationally, he's class. He, he's, just, he's just a class rugby player. He's talking of him going to Bayonne. He disappeared, though, didn't he? So he played really well a couple of years ago against England and then just disappeared. Well, he, he, when he was... Yeah, well, that's the thing. He went to Glasgow off the back of that and I don't know. I don't know what happened, if there was anything that happened between him and Dave Rennie or whatever, but... I don't know Hugh Jones that well. I don't know his story of what he needs, but it looks like he needs an arm round him. Uh, if you can catch him, really, because he's so quick. But uh, he's a quality player. He's a class. Yeah. He's got. He's an outside, outside bet for the for the Lions tour. I mean, I had Nick Tonkins at 12. Hugh Jones at 13 now as well. So don't listen to me. Matt, happy for Scotland. Hamish Watson again. Um, he's now on the plane, on the bus, in the car, on his bike, at the Barbers. Hopefully not. Um, he's a he's social, social skipper, isn't he? But also, He's like, good like he could yeah. lead the charge on the socials, I reckon. He could, yeah, if you're allowed. I don't know, if, uh, will they be in a COVID bubble playing China? I hope not, because it's a tour. Uh, yeah, not, not much more to say on Scotland. The big thing for them is six-day turnaround now. A few injuries in the squad, uh, but they've got to go to Paris and do the impossible. But Finn's if anyone back. could do it... Finn's back, baby. 
Finn's back. If anyone can do it, <laughs> look what we did to England. You know, we were second from bottom in the Six Nations. Scotland can do it with all of Wales behind them. Well, let's wrap up the Six Nations chat now by looking at the Guinness Pine Predictor on Match Point. How nah. are you guys getting on? What, what nah, do you think, let's look, Jim? Nah, let's just leave it there. How are you getting on, Jim? You're an I'm embarrassment. You're an embarrassment. Not, I am. Like, we've learned through this that right, you write people off and you get predictions wrong. And you're... I think you're something like 14,140th in our league. Like embarrassing you. I'm what? 14,140th in our league. Well, it's not 15,000, is it? I'll take it. <laughs> Mate, Silver horrific, lining. Horrific scenes. And you dropped loads of places. What, what did you back this weekend? Who did I back? I backed England. I mean, how stupid of me. They finished second from bottom. Uh, who else did I back? I backed France. Got that right. Yeah. And um, Scotland, Scotland by how many? I, I, only, I think I only went by about 13. 13. Yeah, I mean, I was just showing respect to Italy, <laughs> weren't I? Because that's what I do. I'm just, I'm just I'm respectable like that. But the, the quicker this one's forgotten, the better, not just for me, but for England as well. <laughs> well, if you want to get involved, there's still one more chance in this tournament. And it's going to be back for the Women's Six Nations in April as well. Just download the Match Pint app from all good app stores. Predict the scores, beat your mates, win great rugby prizes. Make sure you join the UK's biggest private league with the code RugbyPod. The winner of that this weekend is going to get last year's Calcutta Cup match ball signed by the captains Owen Farrell and Stuart Hogg. All right, should we get your final prediction? What's going to happen this weekend, boys? France. Oh, France, by our France by our money. Firstly, and I know that France are basically five and a half days by the time they've gone to sleep on a turnaround. There shouldn't be a six-day turnaround. I'll re- reiterate that Scotland should have won this game 28 nil, and but the we players, have finished the, play, the players would rather have gone to Paris and earned that victory than been gifted it. Jim. Nah, mate. What do you mean gifted it? We, we did nothing wrong. No, I know what you can get given. <laughs> yeah, it's ah. Oh, I'm looking at this the Scotland squad. So you've got Finn back, obviously, which is going to be big. Playing in Paris, he knows the crap around there. There's no Johnny Gray. There's no Scott Cummins. France need to win by 21 points and score four tries to win the title well it's going to be interesting if that's the case if they've got to throw everything at it um, I just don't know this Six Nations is so hard to call really you look at France with what they can do they turn it on when it matters against Wales they won you want a quick answer I think it's going to be tough for Scotland let's just keep it under 50 and I'll be happy and um we can celebrate at home via Zoom if that is the case because we didn't finish second from bottom. It's going to be tough. I want Scotland to win, obviously. Um, so you've gone, you've got think, France by 50? 48. France by 48, Jim. What's wrong no, with that? No, that's all. I'm not. I'm just joking that. I'm just hoping. I'm going to go France by nine. I think Scotland will make a tough game of it for them. I think we're a good team now. I genuinely do. So, I mean, Ireland... That game was the probably one where we didn't play that well, but yeah, come on, Scotland. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm going to go with France. They need to win by 21 points and score four tries. Uh, I don't think they've got that in them, though. I don't think they've got that in them against the. Look at you! Look at you! So I think it's going to be France by 20 instead of 21. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's have a quick chat about the Premiership because it was a crazy weekend, really, wasn't it? Goody wasps, finally. They won a game. Get some players back. Launchbury made a difference. Uh, Alfie Barbary comes off the bench in the second half. Um, my God, he's got a he's got back. Hairdo. He's got back quick, hasn't he? Horrific hairdo. He's got a bit of a Ned Kelly on him, but my God, has he got dad strength? Absolute dad strength, just to get rid of defenders again. Someone has else he got kids? Want to see. Mate, he's, he's about twelve years old, mate. I hope, well, I that's hope what not. I mean. <laughs> that's what I mean. That, he's got that. How good's that? I've got dad strength, but I ain't got no kids. <laughs> um, yeah, he came off the bench, made a bit of a difference. Um, you know, Jimmy Gopper's experience at 10 instead of playing centre. And uh, yeah, things turned. Um, some powerful sort of ball carriers in the second half to, do- to dominate that facet of the game. Um, the big talking point was the gouge from Carreras, the, uh, the winger. And people say, oh, you can't call it gouging. He's lay on the floor and had a, he's looking the other way. And then he's had a look in and then shoved his hand in there and, and put his hands across his face. So he's deliberately gone in with the fingers towards the eye area. Um, 
and he should have been red carded. The problem is, once you restart the game and Jimmy Goffman had a penalty, kicked it over pretty quickly. The ref didn't say, listen, we need to check this. When there's someone accusing you of a gouge, it needs to be checked. And um, I think Graham Hughes, the TMO, is definitely having a poo at that point because he can't have been watching it because it was clear as day on the TV, right? Yeah, I agree. And I don't want to be horrible to the Argentinians, but the Argentinian once gouged me, Andrew, when we were talking about it before. And it was in the scrum. And poor Juan Figolo, 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 when we played against Argentina in the World Cup of 2011, Someone called 69 and I sent it through and I hit Juan. And then when I went to Montpellier, he was my neighbour and wouldn't speak to me for two days until I, he told me that I punched him in the scrum. And I said, well, blame the guy that gouged me two years prior. But anyway, <laughs> let's, not, let's not get into details about that. But like I said before, mate, you can't put fingers in eyes. They're not meant to go there. They're not. Bristol have got a decent cushion at the top now after the uh, win at Saints, haven't they? Yeah, uh, I mean, Bristol next are going to finish top two, um, I think, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, you know, they were under a bit of pressure at Saints, get two tries in the last five minutes to win it. Um, we say the same things every week. They are proper contenders this year, aren't they, Jim? And, and again, without stating the obvious, with what Bristol have been through as a club and the investment and the foundations that are now in place, if they can go all the way, it's the same story as Exeter last year, winning the double with no fans. Um, that's where I feel for Bristol. So there's a part of me that almost don't want them to do it this year. And then for them to do it next year when they've got, well, if there's fans in stadium there, so look at me preempting it a year, a year on from COVID. What do I know? What happened on Saturday? Because there were massive wins for both Bath and Quinns, and then tons of points at Sandy Park as well, wasn't there? Yeah, Leicester, to be fair, I spoke to my mate at Leicester who coaches there. Um, that's actually quite a good result for Leicester. I said there was a red card in the game for them, but the resilience, I've seen enough in Leicester now where they're definitely going in the right direction. Wigglesmith makes a massive difference. You know, the kicking game, the experience that they've got, you know, sign some South African lads, Leicester, and then you'll be sweet. We've always said, if you're struggling, sign some Saffers, they'll do the job for you. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Lavanini playing well for them as well. No, I don't, I don't know why I'm saying that. I didn't see the game. I'm talking <laughs> shit. <laughs> I wonder where you're going. Because Van, Port, Van Portfleet came on and scored, didn't he? All I know is, is I'm happy to see Leicester performing well, extra good team I mean who knows I'm just going to leave it at that look how much ruggers there are the one thing is is the amount of games they're having to play yeah. I think it's you know week on week it almost taken a little bit of the energy out of it I don't know if I sound less energetic but I well, am there's a lot of rugby on and, and the other thing is for these premiership teams I think this is week nine on the spin or something in terms of, pre- in terms of premiership games so we need to understand and everyone watching needs to understand that the emotional energy of, of what they're doing, going back to back nine games on the spin um, is crazy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Worcester 40 nil down at half time away at Bath. I mean, what, what's that about? Gloucester taking 59 points down at Quinns. Who takes 59 points anywhere? Or oh, sorry. Who takes nearly 60 points anywhere except for Saracens at the Rico Arena a couple of years ago? I mean, my it- goodness. India at half time, but on the Worcester oh, yeah. one, I remember my, when I was playing fast tag always Edinburgh and we were playing against Newport Gwent Dragons, right? And we're about 38 points down. Let's just round it up to 50 at half time. And I remember the coach, I won't name him because he's an absolute legend. I'm going, I'm like looking around to the lads, like, what the fuck? What's going on here? Like trying to give them an arousing speech to be like, let's get out there, like the Andy Powell where he gives a speech playing against Italy and he walks into the, the mop cupboard. So I'm the same. I'm in the changing room trying to give the speech to the lads. And the coach said, like, hey, hey, calm down, big fella. Calm down, calm down. I can that, I can that, I can. This is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. I'm thinking, right, what are we going to do? We're just going to call 69. We're all going to kick off. We're going to play. We're going to get back out there and we're going to play. We're going to play, 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 play. Finished up 58 points to three. <laughs> 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 who was the coach who was the coach name and shame I'm not, he's a legend he's a legend I'm not going to say because he's, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a top guy but yeah I mean Paul Worcester uh, at, least, at least we know it's not Andy Robinson then right um, anyway yeah Worcester 40 nil down uh, they did fight back and got a bonus point for four tries scored uh, to n- near the end of the game but yeah I mean Bath have found some form since um, I said it the other week since Stuart Hooper did gave that arousing speech handing those jerseys out to him I mean, that's uh, we've always said that was the turning point. Um, so yeah, um, um, yeah, uh, yeah. 
I'm Fuck. being so horrible today. Sorry, I'm in a good mood as well. I shouldn't be being that horrible. Let's finish things off with the good, the bad, and the ugly, which is brought to you by the good guys at Sons, who are doing really important work helping men with one of the key health issues that doesn't often get talked about, how to keep their hair. There are men's health brand that offers a range of licensed and medically proven products for preventing and treating hair loss, and they deliver via a monthly or three-monthly subscription direct to your door. It's reasonably priced, and they get results in nine out of 10 men. So just visit suns.co.uk and use the code rugbypod20 to get 20 quid off your first order. That's S-O-N-S.co.uk, and the code is rugbypod20. Yeah, plenty of good this weekend, and we're going to start off in the Guinness Pro 14. And the mighty Ospreys, Jim. Toby Boone's yeah. Ospreys with a massive victory in Leinster. I say massive victory. Massive in terms of getting a victory in Leinster is always very, very tough. But they won the game 24 points to 19 after being 19-3 down with 12 minutes left on the clock. And by doing that and winning the game, they qualify for the Champions Cup next year. So uh, fantastic performance by Toby Booth and all his men. What else was good? We'll stick in the Guinness Pro 14, Jim. And um, we'll give someone a nod in Scotland. And Rufus name, McLean. Yay, Rufus yeah. McLean. Uh, there we go. Just him on his own for that try for Glasgow against the Dragons at the Principality Stadium. I'm not going to talk, about, math. I'm not going to talk math. about the performance because Glasgow lost, didn't they, Jim? But Rufus McLean, if you get a chance, Google his try against the Dragons. Oh, my wheels. Here comes a hot stepper. Murderer! <laughs> I have to say that, but... Yeah, you can. Uh, what else was good? The Tri-Fest in the Premiership this weekend. Uh, 52 tries were scored across the six games in the Premiership, which is the joint most in a round of Premiership rugby since 2007-2008. So lots of decent attacking rugby, not so much for the defence. Um, what else was good? Let's go to international rugby for a bit of good, Jim. And you know this guy particularly well. Dr. James Robson. Uh, had his 250th international at the weekend as a doctor for Scotland against Italy. That is a hell of a stint. He must be about 403 by now. All I know is he's a legend. And one, one, this one night at band camp, he stroked my head to sleep when my toe was stood on and it was throbbing like you've never seen in your life where I'm in tears. I had some tramadols because that's what you could have back then. And he's stroking me head to sleep because I, could, I was... I was trying to chop my toe off and he was like you can't don't do it you're out of nails you probably would do it but don't so a big shout out to Dr James Robson what an absolute legend he had Tom Evans give him a video message um, but everyone was more bothered about Tom's girlfriend slash fiance um, slash lover in Nicole Scherzinger and I think that was enough for James Robson that he knew that he'd made it <laughs> yeah a massive shout out to Dr. James Robson, hell of a stint there, and hopefully plenty more to come. Uh, we'll stay in international rugby and stay in the good. France are going to get a mention this week. Uh, coming back from being 10 points down with five minutes to go to keep the dream alive of winning the Six Nations. Uh, brilliant game of rugby. And we'll mention Wales as well in the good. Although they lost, it was a hell of a game of rugby and something to really whet the appetite on a Saturday evening. Um, what else was good? We'll go to the Premiership. And we mentioned them before, but the mighty Wasps, we'll get them in. Of course we will. We haven't won a game in ages. So Wasps get a mention the good for beating Newcastle 20 points of 18 on Friday night up at Kingston Park. Good stuff for them. But the good this week uh, goes to a whole country Scotland. and an individual player. It's not Scotland, Jim. Um, it is your Celtic neighbours, though. Uh, Ireland and specifically CJ Stander. Um, Ireland's overall performance was phenomenal uh they've been bullied by england for the last four games well they turned into the bullies this weekend physically dominated england and turned the tables completely with that performance tactically they're on point physically uh their kicking game the set piece any facet of the game they dominated england so they get a massive shout out uh and cj stander what a man announces international retirement produces a barnstorming display even getting up and smiling after taking it into contact and Billy Vunapola, Curry, and someone else, I can't remember who else it was, tried to absolutely blast into him. Um, he gets up smiling. He was a top ball carrier in the Six Nations uh, in four of the last five seasons, and what a way to finish your international career. Uh, the bad, um, we'll start off in the Premiership. Gloucester got hosed 59 points to 24 at Quinns, who, apart from Saracens, takes nearly 60 points at the Rico Arena. Do you remember that, Jim? Do you remember that one? Uh, who takes nearly 60? Oh, I, don't. I don't. I don't. Mate, Blaine Sips. That's all I know. <laughs> Apparently he's off um, the bath. 
Yeah, possibly, possibly. Um, that's bad. Worcester as well, they're getting to mention the bad. We just mentioned it. 40 nil down at half time, although they did uh, come back and get a bonus point. But they conceded the bonus points. They conceded four tries within 22 minutes. Play, 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 big fella. <laughs> exactly. Um, sticking with the theme of shipping over 50 are uh, Italy. Who ships 50 against Scotland? No one. When was the last time Scotland put 50 on anyone? Georgia, was it? <laughs> the autumn there. It's just a regular occurrence for us. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but again, Italy, that's the worst six nations ever for them. Serious questions need to be asked now. There's got to be some sort of playoff game at some point between them and Georgia. I think Georgia have won about 400 games on the trot in the B6 nations. So, um, yeah, let's see if we can manufacture that through the rugby pod, eh, Jim? I'd prefer Russia. Imagine a night out in Russia. Not that it's about the nights out. Imagine a night out in Russia on Zivodka. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. Uh, but the bad this week uh, can only go to England, James. England. Yeah, it can. Dominated by Ireland. So, dominated by Ireland. Um, joint highest penalties conceded in the Six Nations ever. 67 penalties. Uh, joint with Italy. Uh, most points ever conceded in the Six Nations by England. 121 points. Uh, only the second time we finished fifth in the Six Nations. 2018 was the other time under Eddie Jones as well. And we've never, ever, 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 ever lost to Scotland, Ireland and Wales in the Six Nations. So not even when I played, when we were that shit and I was playing in Sassel Rugby, have we lost to all three of them in the Six Nations. The last time we lost to all three of them in the same season was in 1976, uh, when we won the reverse triple crown. Or what do you call it, Jim? The triple... Triple spoon. Yeah, the triple spoon. So um, not good for England. Out-muscled, out-thought, out-coached, um, out-played in every facet of the game. And um, some big question marks now for Eddie Jones to answer. I just wish they gave away two extra penalties and then we could have had a laugh about it. <laughs> there we go. Uh, the ugly. A um, few bits of ugly, actually. The online abuse, to start off with, directed at Liam Williams at the WRU highlighted. Um, you can... Question people's performances, but don't get abusive. Uh, Bundyaki's red card. Um, the hit. Oh on, yeah, we didn't speak about that, did we? Yeah, the hit on Billy Vanapola. He's done it before as well, so he's just got to go lower. I know Big yeah, Billy's he, coming he out like that, doesn't he? He yeah. does it like that, but it's you've got to change it. Everyone knows now. It's been around for ages. You can't try and smash someone upright with your chest pointing upwards. So um, uh, Bundyaki, love him as a player, but you just need to sort that out pretty quickly. Um, Paul Willem says, fingers in the eyes of Wynne Jones. Not a great look at all, really. Um, I think it's accidental, but it uh, doesn't matter that it's accidental. You've got to take more care there. Paul Willemson will get a bit of a ban for that. But the worst one for me is Matteo Carreras uh, on Josh Bassett in the Wasps' victory over Newcastle. He's definitely gone looking for it. He's definitely rubbed his fingers across the eyes. Um, really bad form. Watch the video replays. It is just deliberate as they come. So uh, hopefully Matteo Carreras gets a big ban for that because he deserves one. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Gertie. Thanks, Producer Tim. And thank you very much for listening. Don't forget, we are moving over to Spotify. I don't know if you've heard. Yeah! <laughs> and something that I've seen on Twitter a few times this week because they don't want to have to pay for it. It is free. If you go over to Spotify, it's free. You don't have to pay for a thing. So make sure you get over there onto Spotify and follow us and subscribe and check us out on YouTube as well. Rugby pod. Pod, pod, pod. <laughs>